Welcome, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Joanne. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes. Beautiful day outside, isn't it? Yes. But it's more beautiful in here, though. So <laughs> we're actually getting out early today. Let me know when 6.15. <laughs> right now. Well, who won the game? Uh, Carolina was losing by eight with like three minutes left to go. Oh. Yeah. Uh, no, no, uh, John Henson. Yeah, same one. He's either got a sprained wrist or a Carolina fracture, so. Uh, with about three seconds, they were down by two. And you just missed a basket as oh a <laughs> <laughs> They lost well, by two. They, at least they no, didn't they lose by 30. Only three seconds to go. It doesn't sound good. Well, they'll, they'll be in the. They'll, they'll be a one seed. Yeah. Because Syracuse lost a couple of. Uh, I don't know if we're in Kansas. Well, enjoy, enjoy the readings uh, this time, or the reading. Yeah, one reading this time. Yeah. Did you keep up with all of the flanks, left flank, right flank, center flank? <laughs> Good readings. <laughs> readings. We read it more than once. <laughs> I, I tell you, I am. Uh, I, I I teach uh, American history from the time that uh, we're way back until the present, and very seldom do I talk about battles. Uh, I don't like war, so I I don't uh, get really involved in the flights. Uh, but uh, I do know a little bit. I know where to go to find the information if I want to know it. But for the most part, kind of look at the impact that that particular battle had on uh, the domestic and some, in some cases even the international scene. And I think that MacPherson does a, a wonderful job of, uh, of doing both. Uh, the very technical, detailed battle information as well as the impact of those battles on, on the society as a whole. Uh, an excellent writer, uh, very easy to follow, very easy to understand. Uh, one of my favorite writers, he and James G. Uh, Randall, and I think they probably, uh, more than anybody else in my opinion, uh, bring the Civil War to life in a way that uh, you can really understand it. Now, I, I received an email from Joanne indicating that you all would rather have a lecture format. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but um, what, I, what I'd like to do for a little while this afternoon is to address any questions that you might have. Uh, you might have some burning questions, or you might even have some burning testimonies <laughs> that you'd like uh, to, to make. Uh, so we'll, we'll take time to do that. It can be anything related to the Civil War. Uh, if I cannot answer it, more than likely we'll have, we have someone in here who can, uh, who can answer, or we can direct you to the source. And if you look at the bibliography in my person's book, I think that any question that you have can be answered by looking at that bibliography. It is a, a wonderful bibliography. Over the next four years, you know, we will be inundated with uh, Civil War stuff. I have been to a lot of Civil War stuff, actually beginning in 2007, when uh, the Department of Cultural Resources uh, actually began putting together a series of programs that will take place bet between 2000. 11 and 2015. Uh, we had a huge program uh, last May with some of the outstanding scholars coming in, a whole day of activities, and we'll have three more of those huge programs uh, uh, until by 2015. So this is the, the time. Uh, if you wanted to know anything about the Civil War, uh, something going on at NCCU, UNC, uh, NC State, Duke, uh, probably uh, once a month or so over the next four years. So if you want to get in on it, uh, 
you know, make sure you check out the newspaper, check out the, the, uh, the websites, and, uh, and go listen to some of this stuff. And the great thing about this is that we have some outstanding scholars who have already been to the area and those who will, who will continue to come over the next few years. Uh, we, will, we will have a, a huge program um, at UNC Charlotte uh, before the year ends. I don't know, don't know the specific date. We'll have one at UNC Wilmington and one at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, also, over the next year or so, you know, there has been an attempt to reinterpret the history of North Carolina. And so the Department of Cultural Resources uh, has put together what I think is a, is a wonderful set of programs uh, to do just that, bringing in scholars who, uh, who are now doing cutting edge research on North Carolina. Um, North Carolina is, is one of those states you know, where we, we have, we've had problems interpreting the history uh, in many, in many, for many reasons because uh, of the dearth of information. Uh, we just have not had the sources. Uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, 200 years ago, 250 years ago, it seems that uh, some people who worked for the government just didn't think holding on to papers was really important. And uh, we have, uh, this issue of the destruction, and in some cases, the burning of papers accidentally, uh, the use of papers to get a, a stagecoach out, out of the mud. Uh, so we, we just have not done the best job with, uh, with preserving our, our records. Uh, but the records, of course, that we do have, we, we have done a great job over the last 120 years or so of, of maintaining what we have. But uh, for, for the next uh, year or so, these voyages to North Carolina, we had one at ECU uh, back in February. Uh, we have one at NCCU taking place on October 11th and 12th. And we have uh, two days of activities, one day at UNC Chapel Hill, one day at NCCU. So it's a collaborative effort between uh, history departments to actually uh, bring this program where Scholars are reinterpreting uh, North Carolina's history, and we'll have two other programs in 2013. Uh, the, so all you have to do is go to the Department of Cultural Resources website and look uh, at voyages to North Carolina, and you get an idea about what. And uh, it's free. Uh, you have to register. We had about 180 people down at uh, ECU. We're expecting about that number at NCCU uh, in October. Uh, so the, the information is out there. Uh, you can go to it. It can come to you. I, I tease students all the time about how, <laughs> excuse me, how, how easy it is to get information today. I, I told them that uh, when I was a student uh, working on a PhD, if I wanted to read an article, I would have to get out of my bed <laughs> Both will take a shower, uh, put on some clothes, get in a car, and drive. Mm -hmm. Today they can lie around in pajamas, and so the information is is there. It is so easy today. Uh, the study I did on runaway slaves, I had to go to the archives. I had to go to Duke. I had to go to the North Carolina collection. The South the uh, Southern Historical Collection to actually put my hands on the documents. But today, it's digitized. And, and you can actually manipulate the runaway slave advertisements in so many different ways. So to a great extent, uh, research uh, is easy. And uh, I, I tell them that, you know, you, even though I, I think they should know the old way, uh, you don't want to be caught up uh, riding horse and buggy when everybody else is flying in a jet plane. So it's important that you get, a, get on board that, uh, that 747, 757, 767 uh, in terms of the, the information highway. So at this point, um, I will take a few questions uh, related or not related to uh, the book for this time. Yes, sir.
When you look at, uh, at the Civil War, thousands of people are killed. You look at uh, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, thousands of people are killed. Is, is war, do you think war is part of the human DNA? Is it something that we, we think we'd learn, okay? But we never seem to learn, do we? That's a great, that's a great, a great question. I, I think that when we actually look back on time immemorial, we see that not only this species that we call human beings fight, but all species fight. And it's almost like it's a, I, I really hate to say that it's almost like a natural occurrence that we put up our defenses sometimes automatically that uh, thousands and thousands of years ago when people met, they didn't greet each other, hi, how are you doing, so good to see you. And in many cases, they would simply uh, take each other prisoners. Uh, that was the first thing they did. Uh, I think uh, we are naturally imbued with a, a kind of uh, ethnocentrism. Uh, I am who I am, I am better than. I look different, so I must be superior. Um, all those things kind of come together, and when you believe that you're threatened, the first thing you do is to throw up your defenses. Uh, I hope it's not a part of the DNA, um, which means that uh, we're doomed. But I, I think there, there's something about a kind of innate uh, quality if you want to use the word quality, that human beings and animals all have. You know, for example, if, you, if two animals happen to meet, uh, one will bristle up almost automatically to, to protect himself. It's almost like uh, protecting turf. Uh, and you know, that's, whether or not that's learned behavior or some kind of you know, inborn or genetic, uh, some kind of predisposition. I really don't know. There was a question here first. And I go, so I don't know if I answered the question. I'm not sure that, that any of us can really answer that question. But I really hope that it's not a part of the You found DNA. societies that have been at peace for centuries, that have never been at war. I, I don't know. I haven't. I don't know. Perhaps someone else, do you know of any societies where conflict at some point in time has not arisen? I, I think that if we, we looked at it closely enough, we might find some. But generally speaking, people have to defend themselves uh, and have done so for thousands and, and thousands of years. Well, we're more closely related to chimpanzee the great apes, and certainly the most aggressive. Um, at one point, we were probably down to 10,000 as a species. And so when we started out, we weren't really that impressive when we looked at some of the other animals. And I do think it is a part of our DNA, and a part of where, why we thirst for, for peace, and all kinds of things that we, we, we reach for in our religions and other things. Um, to understand it, and I think when people go to war, they're shocked themselves of, of what comes out of them in, 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 to defend their country or to just the state of So I personally, I have a little anthropology as a black history, and um, personally I think it is. Okay. There's a question here then, Chris. Um, I left with the question of, of after reading McClellan's mm -hmm. <laughs> leadership, um, when when was the, it officially um, said that the President of the United States is the Commander in Chief? Because I, I was appalled, I was yeah. amazed that he goes to the tent and says, "McClellan, you got it," and McClellan says, uh, I, "I think." Can you that imagine that happening today? Yes. <laughs> yes. How long did that Colonel? Well, he did fighting get rid of it. Yeah. 
I, and and the, you know, McClellan simply had the slows. <laughs> and, uh, but, but there may have also been some, some other reasons as to why he had the slows. And that may have been his, um, not his love, surely, but his disdain, his hatred for what he saw happening in Washington. And, uh, you know, it, there's a possibility that if he had, had given the orders, uh, folks would have actually turned on Washington. Um, but I think Lincoln had to play it based on the cards that he had been actually given. And, and those cards indicated to a great extent that McClellan uh, was a very, very powerful man in terms of his relationship with those, with those soldiers. Mm -hmm. And I think that Lincoln was very aware of that. And uh, perhaps he, he never uttered, but there's a possibility that he thought that McClellan could actually turn on me. He could turn on Washington. Well, he and so wondered. I think he... Didn't, didn't Lincoln wonder if he was being intentionally? Oh, he, he said, he, he didn't wonder, he actually said mm -hmm. that, that indeed uh, this man was, uh, was soft. Mm -hmm. on the on the south but uh, I think he had to play those cards that he had been been given very very carefully mm -hmm. and then when when it came to um, when push came to a grave shove he had to go ahead and take that chance uh -huh. I wonder whether uh, Nick Ferson overstated the clarity of uh, the loss uh, by the South and the victory of the North at Antietam. Um, and he does quote a couple of Southern newspapers that claimed it was a victory. But other than that, it seems to be that the British and the French, who were obviously important in, in, the, in the narrative, as well as the North, and it sounds like generally in the South, Southern soldiers and non-soldiers alike thought that it was a loss. But if you just look at the facts presented, you've got approximately the same number of casualties on both sides, assuming anybody even knew the numbers, mm -hmm. and I doubt that was widely known. Um, certainly the, South, the Southern Army left the field and left the state of Maryland, um, but it, I don't know that they had announced that they were going to stay or what they were going to do or why they were there. And they did have this nice victory at Harper's Ferry. Um, so it, it, I, I wasn't persuaded from the book that it was such a decisive fact. It was clearly a, a, a change from the direction it had been for the past, for the previous several months. Mm -hmm. But instead of going in reverse, getting into neutral isn't exactly the same thing as going forward. Yeah, so, I, I wouldn't have even titled the book uh, crossroads, freedom. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define success. If, if, if indeed success meant that uh, John Lee's army actually retreated back across the Potomac, then, then I guess that's success. But when you look at the number of casualties, uh, the 20, between 23 I've seen, 23,000 I've seen, 25, 27, I, I guess nobody really knows the exact number. But when you look at, at the casualties uh, on both sides, and, and uh, when you look at, at what actually occurs within a few months of 1862, I just don't see it as a turning point in the war. Uh, Lincoln saw it as a turning point, and he issues the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, the folks over in Europe look at it as a turning point. They decide not to do what? <clears throat> so in, in, that, in that way, I guess, <laughs> I guess you could say it was, you know, it was a, a turning point in, in the war. But to me, it was not so decisive uh, that looking back on it, you know, we could, <clears throat> we could just put it out there like my my person does. I just don't see it uh, because within a few months, I mean, we know we know what happens. We know that that uh, there are southern southern victories. Uh, eventually, in 1863, you know, the War Department uh, 
Edward M. Stanton agrees that it's time to begin using black troops. Um, I mean, if it were so decisive, why do you need to recruit these black troops? And over the next few months, you know, uh, the 54th Massachusetts Regiment is started, the 55th Regiment is started, um, and over the next uh, year or so, 180,000 blacks have joined up uh, with the Union forces. Um, so I, I, I think that looking back, um, I would not have selected Antietam as, as the turning point. What uh, would you have selected? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you, you get yourself in trouble when you do that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think things really began to go downhill uh, for the South uh, at Gettysburg. Um, I mean, when you look at the, in, in our last session, we talked about as, assets and liabilities. Uh, without a doubt, uh, the South understood that overall, the North had the greater resources. And, and General Lee, of course, believed that if, if you don't, you know, do the old coup de grace right now, then uh, we'll, we'll, never be, we'll never win this war. He understood that their resources, northern resources, would, would definitely trump the South if we didn't administer the old knockout uh, blow. And uh, by 1864, you can really see those northern assets you, you know, taking over and actually manifesting themselves to the extent that the, that the South you know, can't win this, can't win this war. Let me get to Chris, and then I'll come back over here. I had initially going to come in by the gentleman's first question, but I'm certainly going to Antietam here, but um, saying that you talk about the savagery of war, which in the last hundred years has certainly ramped up. But at the same time, if you look at the, uh, the multiplication of the human race across the globe, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to be a fatal flaw if it is in the DNA. It doesn't appear to be fatal. We are, there's more of us. It is, uh, and even though war is still widely practiced, there are other things that are also widely practiced. And so I'm more like, well, <laughs> before um, any combat of any significant scale, there is usually a several years run up of an attempt at diplomacy, right? I mean, to include World War One, World War Two, you know, right? At least on our side, and World War One particularly, right? We're, right? we're late to the party on that one. Um, Roosevelt was famously neutral you know, until we were attacked, um, you know, and even uh, the Chamberlain, uh, Neville Chamberlain was trying to do everything but get in a fight with Germany in World War II, right? Uh, so, you know, I think that it is, we are more and more a people that will try everything but that. In the Civil War, right? I mean, how long did we, I say we, so I love the Mason Mason line, uh, <laughs> appease or attempt to appease the South. And how long did that go on? 30, 40, 50 years <laughs> trying to not have a fight over this. Yeah, right. So, so I think that, you know, um, while it is sometimes you know, horrific when you look at, especially like World War I, because it seems so pointless, right? How many tens of millions died and 20 years later we're fighting the same fight, you know? But um, I'm more hopeful that it's not a fatal flaw if it, if it is in our DNA. Where there's more of us now than there ever been. So what Chris is saying, relatively speaking, we're doing all right. We're, we're right. <laughs> I mean, relative it's three to steps the, forward, two steps back, perhaps, but it is three steps forward. Relative to the six billion people on the face of the earth. Right. Uh, and that was not the case, you know. Right, so. I feel a lot better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. But our brain might be the fatal flaw because we have the atomic bomb. Yes. And species rise and species die. Sure. As, as nations do. Sure, but um, we... Um, and then what is peace? Because when we say peace, we're talking about a government and a government that was formed. But what about the four million who were raped, killed, right. worked? That's not peace. Um, I think out of, out of that kind of aggression, you, you, you get greatness. Great civilizations are very aggressive. Um, they give us great art. They give us great literature, mainly because they're busily um, uh, conquering people and bringing all these people together who come together with great art and great ideas. 
you know, when you look at the majesty of Rome um, and ancient Greece. In fact, when you think about a lot of things that you've had us reading, it's, it's like reading um, um, Odysseus and the Iliad, because we're always coming home yes. from war yes. and rethinking who we are yes. as a people. Um, some, of the, some of the most righteous generals of all, and some of those biblicals, Joshua didn't leave anything standing. If he were going to Greensboro, he didn't like anything at his back. He would kill every man, woman, child, and dog. When they said Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, so even some of our biblical people to whom who are our leaders were fierce, were fierce generals. Sure. One last comment on the, on the, you know, the DNA thing, though, and, and human beings versus, you know, you say how close we are related to great apes. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing we do have, you know, we have the brain stem, which is, you know, the fight, flight stuff, heart, lung, blood, I mean, we kind of the blind range kind of potential. But we also have a cerebral cortex, and ours is thicker than mm -hmm. the other animals. And that's where we think our humanity comes from. That's where we think our reason, our conscious, you know, we know, human beings are the only animal that we know can know as it's known. Right? I am conscious right now that I am learning something about the Civil War. Absolutely. We don't believe that other animals have that ability. We, we, we assign it to instinct. Mm -hmm. My cat knows how to hunt a bird because that's already hardwired. He doesn't mm -hmm. think about it. Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. And I do think that gives us a, an advantage long term, um, despite I'm not going to quibble with anything you said, because you're absolutely correct. Uh, uh, but I do think that tied in with this idea that we're three steps forward, only two steps back, mm -hmm. is this idea of a cerebral cortex mm -hmm. that separates us from the blind killing. You know, we, we do pause, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even both armies had to pause at the end of the day and oh, sort of really. begin to take in the enormity of this event. And it's one of the few times I'll feel at all any sympathy from McClellan. Mm -hmm. If you just saw what he just saw, I mean, you might not really think, oh, let's go pursue this. Oh, yeah. I want more fighting. <laughs> It was a blessing. That's why I saw here in London. <laughs> in the back. What's your name? Give us your name, Mark. Mark. Okay, Mark. The, uh, uh, just to speculate a little bit, since we know what happens in the Civil War, when you talk about McClellan being soft on uh, the South, evidently that was a debate among a number of generals. They were fighting their brothers, their cousins, their people. And that some thought that the best way was to uh, uh, to do the least damage possible. And later on, the the tide changes, and they say we have to really annihilate them in order to win. And I wonder if the soft side had won, and it's a speculation, would we have the venom that we have still? as a residual of the Civil War, in which we have so many Southerners who uh, are safe with their Confederate money, and that uh, and feel uh, they were so defeated, so uh, crushed into the ground, I'm talking particularly about planters, but that goes to a lot of rednecks, as we say, <laughs> that uh, the, uh, uh, I am surprised uh, about how much of that venom still occurs 150 years later, and had there been some other way other than absolute uh, stomping on their cousins, their brothers, and running them literally into the ground, if we would still have that kind of venom. And I said that calls for some speculation, but could you add some, shed some light on that in terms of uh, how widespread was this notion of being soft? I don't think because he was a coward, but because he had a different philosophy about how the ultimate win would occur. I think that perhaps we really don't understand the extent to which people hated each other decades in advance of the Civil War. Uh, that, that's, a, that's one of those uh, debates, one of those discussions that we don't really you know, get into very often. But it ran deep. And the closer we, we get to the night to the eighteen fifties, it, it, it seems like uh, you know the deeper it, it actually and more intense uh, the rivalry, the hatred. Um, and, and it and it began early. Uh, you can see it in the eighteen twenties. 
I mean, by the 1820s, there is this battle between the North and the South. Uh, by 1828, there is this nullification crisis. Uh, it was John C. Calhoun, who is Vice President of the United States, resigns. He resigns because he believes that the North, and these, these are the words that he used, the North is attempting to reconstruct the South in its image. This is 1820, 1828, 1829. The protective tariff of 1828 had been passed. Southerners referred to it as what? The tariff of abominations. The tariff of abominations. <laughs> One had been passed in 1816, one in 1824, and one in 1828. They just said would absolutely destroy the South. John C. Calhoun wrote something entitled the South Carolina Exposition and Protest, wrote it anonymously, handed it out to people in Congress, handed it out to legislators across the South. In other words, we have to kill we have to rescind this protective tariff. And it was ugly, so much so that when King made his famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963, he used the, the phrase, and their lips are dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. In other words, this, this, uh, this ugly, polarization that had, had begun very, very early manifests itself right down to the present time, but in 1963, King was talking about the fact that people were defying the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. And those governors and those people in the South are doing everything in their powers to ensure that desegregation would not come about. And so, you know, it, it, runs, it runs very, very deep and I, I think that people think that, that all of a sudden, you know, it, it began running deep in the 1860s. But when you go back in the 1850s, I mean, so much so that right there in the, in the Senate chamber, uh, Charles Sumner is almost beaten to death by Preston Brooks, what came. You, you see the fireworks in the 1850s. James G. Randall referred to the generation of the 1850s as the blundering generation. He maintained that the war could have been averted, but you had these hotheads in Congress. The hotheads were in Congress. Americans were following their leaders. And if, you had, if cooler heads had prevailed in the 1850s, the war could have been averted. And, and, and after 1828, we have a situation with Texas. I mean, what was the impact of Texas? What was the impact of the Mexican-American War that opened new territory that brought about this desire on the part of Southerners to ex expand, to extend slavery into the western parts? And so you have this battle between Northerners and Southerners over the of the expansion of slavery that they tried to resolve in the Compromise of 1850 didn't work. Southerners declared the only thing we got out of this was a fugitive slave clause, which now says that you, know, you got to pay a thousand dollars if you harbor one of our slaves. But California comes in as a free state. I mean. That's, that's, you know, that's a benefit to the North. Proper sovereignty is applied, but what state actually comes in under proper sovereignty? Not one at all after 1850. And then the slave trade comes to an end in Washington, D.C. Uh, that's a slap in the face to the Southerners. So, you know, even though you have this compromise, you know, the battles, you know, this battle actually continues. And so uh, when, when you get to the Civil War and you get this, this notion by Lincoln and others that 
uh, John McClellan, McClellan had the slows and, and that possibly he was soft. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, there were those individuals, like you say, who, who understood that we're fighting brothers and sisters. We're killing ourselves. And there was this attempt on the part of some of them to kind of hold back in, in some cases. And I think the McClellan, uh, for political reasons as well, you know, just kind of held off. And then he just loved to multiply, I think. You know? <laughs> I, think I, I think he just loved math. I mean, if I got 10, no, it's not 10, it's 20,000. No, it's not 50,000, it's 100,000. Was he that bad? Um, that was his way of sort of slowing them down in terms of his advanced people and, and I, I think that he he really believed that was the case mm -hmm. I, I think he just didn't have you know enough resources around him to go check go check you know this mm -hmm. I was always surprised oftentimes when the scouts were not doing what the scouts right. should, have been, right. should have been doing right. you know I was surprised many, many times. were so aggravated yeah. He's complaining yeah. about his inactions. It was very hard for his subordinates who didn't feel the same way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a question right here. You and I were talking once about <clears throat> if slavery would have probably disappeared on its own without the Civil War within 20 or 30 years, mm -hmm. just due to economic reasons. So that's fascinating to me to speculate about that. Well, you know, by 1861, uh, around the world, uh, how many systems did we actually have? We had the United States, we had Cuba, and we had Brazil. Uh, Cuba it comes to an end in the late 1870s, 1888, in Brazil. Serfdom existed in Russia, but it came to an end actually in 1861. Um, if you believe, in, a few weeks ago we talked about uh, Hinton Rowan Helper, and Helper, actually uh, Lincoln walked around in the White House saying that Helper was our man. You know, without a doubt, had not Hinton Rowan Helper written his book, The Impending Crisis of the South, that we would not be where we are today. He, he really believed that Helper's book really helped, you know, kind of bring this thing to a head. The bottom line was that he believed that the South um, actually would, would go into a state of, of economic depression. Uh, looking at all the census data from the 1850s, he believed that slavery was dying a very slow death. He talked about the, the, the notion that slaves were becoming inflationary, that prices were, were ridiculously high overall, and that, that eventually slavery would die. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to, to not, not difficult to speculate, uh, but sometimes you get in trouble speculating. Uh, but I would venture to say that with what was happening you know, domestically and what was happening internationally, that slavery would, uh, would have died <clears throat> surely by the turn of the 20th century. Um, you know, by the 1870s, um, America was becoming this industrial power. 1870 is a very, very important date. And, and by the 1880s and 1890s, you know, for example, uh, E.C. Knight and Company uh, actually um, manufactured or they processed about 97% of all the sugar that was processed in the United States. If you smoked a cigarette in, in 1900, you know, more than likely was made here in Durham, North Carolina. So mechanization, uh, industrialism as a whole, I think uh, it got to the point where, uh, where slavery surely would have died. Eric Williams told us a long time ago uh, in his book, Capitalism and Slavery, that without a doubt, slavery was responsible for the development of capitalism. But capitalism was also responsible for the death of slavery. And, and that the two really cannot coexist. Yeah. 
another subject entirely. Um, Lee's philosophy, I think, you know, was certainly correct that they needed a knockout punch while his army still was strong. And I'm wondering if, if Jeff Davis and Lee ever discussed the possibility of bringing all the Western Confederate troops to join Lee for that one big push. Uh, that would have, to me, made some deal, a great deal of sense. Well, you know, one of the things about with John Lee is that sometimes he didn't even communicate with, uh, yeah. with, with Jeff Davis. He yeah. kind of went out on his own and did his own thing. Um, so I really don't know. Yeah. No, that were the case. Question? Um, do you know anything else about that um, Order 191 than what um, McPherson tells? Because I, I have not heard about that. Um, finding it underneath the tree. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I mean, that was. It's been a bit out there for a long time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, the story. Do they ever blame somebody or what in the world would they ask? I haven't read any more than what Rand James U. Randall or MacPherson or any of the other scholars have actually written on on the subject. Um, one in a million chances that, that that would actually happen. But even though even though if you believe the story, even though you have the you have that information. I mean, what what good did it really do? He didn't start moving. Huh? He didn't start moving. He didn't move. Eighteen, eighteen, twenty-four hours later. I mean, I guess that if if he had actually started moving immediately, then things definitely would have been a bit been different. A different person, though. Huh? He would have had to have been a different person. Right. Yeah. So I had learned that um, even though we waited the eighteen hours which of course is a nanosecond from McClellan, uh, <laughs> that he, was, he moved so differently that actually he was learned that something was up. Right. You know, and that he actually got, his, you know, he got himself turned around at least to face where he thought McClellan was like, it's like this guy never moves like this. Something is up. Yeah. Something now, is. he probably didn't know that orders had been found. He might have thought, oh, a scout might have you know, gotten yeah. some information to him. So it is interesting that Lee being the kind of guy he is, and in the same way that I think it would Grandly, that they looked to their enemy and kind of had a psychological battle before they had a physical right. battle, right? Exactly. And that's what I mean. So Grant, um, I know when uh, Grant was made commander, that someone was bragging to Lee, oh, we got you know that drunk who's going to be in charge of the Union. Lee, Lee's like, oh no, I got fights. I we're in trouble now. Yeah. Right? The thing about it is you have to remember these guys know each other. Right, know each other well. Yeah, but then they fight together in the next. Exactly. But I think, I, think, I think Lee said something about um, McClellan and said that was a good thing. Um, the bad thing is for us is that McClellan is bringing Lee and how many other soldiers it was. And he said, but the, the good thing is he's also bringing himself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I, in reading this, I, I grew up in Atlanta, so you know Sherman was the boogie bear, the <laughs> bad little girls and boys. But it seems like that the Confederacy had the better generals, and is that just a, except for Sherman and Grant, were the two that I have some knowledge of? Well, why was that? Yes. Was that just a fluke? Was it the military culture in the South, or, or is that not true? They just happened to have taken side. I mean, you you had to make a make a choice in 1861. And, and if you believe that they had the best, the South, I mean, I always heard from the time I was an undergraduate that, oh, the South had the best generals, without a doubt. Well, is that really true, though? Well, I, I, I really, I, you know, I really don't know enough about the military to yeah. assess that. I really don't. Uh, for those of you who know what generalship is, <laughs> I mean, perhaps you, you could, could shed some light on that. Uh, without a doubt, though, when you look at military strategy, uh, it appears that those individuals were the most aggressive. And the northern generals seem to have been a bit less aggressive. But that's just from my kind of general you know, knowledge about it. But for those individuals who study what generals ought to do and where they should move and flank and all this stuff, then perhaps uh, they were better or worse. Scott is going to give us the answer. I mean, not Scott. Well, I it was that after the Civil War, so much thought of the Confederate generalship was focused totally on Lee and Jackson and the Army of Northern Virginia. Okay. But the Confederate Army was a much bigger and broader thing. 
there were some first class idiots up west. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's like you're just comparing the very best to a more wider northern army. Mm -hmm. But what you consider the whole focus, it was really very even. I mean, one of the things that throughout the war that doesn't really get played up is that Civil War generals have a very good learning curve where you would start out at a certain level, after two or three battles, they learned more of what was needed, what they could do, what was absolutely vital. He said, and that was something that happened at the small unit level all the way up to the top. Mm -hmm. but but after, yeah. after Stonewall Jackson was killed, though, the Confederate leadership was severely degraded. I can imagine. That was done. If, if McClellan had been killed, do you think that would have happened as well? <laughs> it, you know, if, if you look at uh, the hierarchy in the military, you find that the majority of them are Southerners. They are and always have been. And the, the, the brilliant students who come out of the uh, West 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 they're Southerners. Hmm. I found that out when I was in the military. Is it was it more of a, a tradition of military service in the South? It was the aristocracy, the well, equine. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why that would be the case. I really don't know. Don't they have all these slaves in the South? I mean, <laughs> you did have that uprising in 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 Louisiana in 1811. My God. Um, and, and the troops saved the day. Um, so when you need more garrisons and other things, hmm. well, you, you, uprisings? you did have additional forces operating in the South. Mm -hmm. I mean, every southern state had a patrol system. Okay. And that patrol system, for example, the one for North Carolina, even though North Carolina was established as a colony in 1663, it wasn't until 1753 that they devised this patrol system, mm -hmm. and it actually operated outside of your regular law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And uh, in North Carolina, for example, I mean, the, the legislature gives you permission to establish a patrol system in your county. So it's a county-based operation. And you divided your county into slave, tro slave patrol districts. And for example, early on, North Carolina had five patrol districts. You had three individuals in each district for a total of 15. But over the years, as the black population increased, as we moved through the revolutionary period, you know, the patrol was given more powers. For example, they, they could actually uh, shoot and kill a slave on sight if they believed the slave were out of hand they could give a slave 10 lashes across the bare back. Uh, so they, they operated outside, in many cases, they, out, they operated outside of the law. Uh, there are a lot of cases in North Carolina, for example, where individual slave owners actually sued the patrol system. And uh, the patrol system was very, very powerful. When you read the slave narratives, you know, the one thing they will talk about are the patty rollers. As we mentioned uh, a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. these individuals, uh, I mean, they, they wreaked havoc. Uh, a lot of folks say they actually became, you know, the KKK mm -hmm. was really, uh, well, the patrol system kind of, you know, manifested itself into what would become the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the same kinds of activities that they performed. Uh, during slavery, these individuals are performing after slavery. And uh, slaves absolutely feared uh, this auxiliary organization that existed in all of these, uh, these southern states. So that, I mean, you could have something there. I mean, you actually have an additional uh, police enforcing agency working. And you're actually giving these people, when, when you serve as a patroller, once you became 21 years of age, you had to serve. And we have, we have people who actually move from county to county to avoid serving. And many of them are, are avoiding service because slaves sometimes 
would, uh, would do some awful things to the patrols. Uh, would burn down their houses, burn down, you know, burn down their, their barns, uh, destroy their tobacco. So uh, dig a hole, um, you know, Saturday night was the night that slaves sometimes were allowed to go out, hang out. Still is, you just, Saturday night is the night, you know, when people, <laughs> people have a good time. And that was surely the case during slavery times. And uh, they would taunt the patrollers. They would uh, dig a hole in the ground, and the patrollers, of course, were on horseback. They would taunt them, Mr. Patrol, I'm over here, come over here, come over here. And of course, the horse and the patrol would fall into the hole, and they would jump in the hole, and in some cases, beat, beat them to death. Um, and we have court records you know, indicating such. So I mean, that's a very good point. There's, a, there's the, the likelihood that uh, that may be the reasons why, a good reason why you have so many of these folks going to, to West Point. How long did the One of the things that struck me was the division in the North, that there yes. were people who wanted to preserve the Union as it was, including slavery. Yes. The, the war people and the peace people, and that I was not aware of. Mm -hmm. we, we, well, growing up, it was kind of a black and white issue. The North was good and the, black and the South was bad. Yeah. But now you're realizing that the North was not unified. There were divisions no. there no, about no. What, how we should proceed. Yeah. I think we perhaps have a lot of misunderstandings about uh, what the North was all about. Uh, I mean, we, you have this impression that you're running away from the South to get to the North and that once I get there, life is going to be grand. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you look at laws of segregation, Jim Crow laws, they did not begin in the South. They were first passed in the North. And, and Southerners, you know, learn from the North, uh, without a doubt. Uh, these laws of segregation are, uh, have been in place in the North, you know, early 17th century. That's a question right here. Right. Well, it ended when slavery came to an end. So in the case of North Carolina from 1753 until 1865. But, you know, it was difficult for people to give that up. Really difficult to give it up. And uh, what emerges out of that, you know, is the Ku Klux Klan, uh, is the convict lease system that, that you found uh, throughout the South. I mean, when you really think about it, if I were a slave owner and I had 50 slaves and the Union troops ride on my plantation and tell me that um, my slaves are free, I, I, I have some issues. I have some very, very serious problems. <laughs> you know, how, how do I reconcile this? And, and, and now I have these folks talking back to me and now I'm having to actually pay these individuals. Now, one of the things that the Freedmen's Bureau did was to negotiate contracts between former slaves and former slave owners. I have to pay these people. And, and what, what emerges is something that's akin to slavery, and that's, that's check cropping. I mean, the bottom line is, what's the difference between slavery and check cropping? Uh, I tell you, uh, when I was 10 years of age, my father, who was born on a farm, and by the time he was 30 or so, he had moved to Hillsborough to the big city and, and married him a, a very, very fair-complexioned woman. And so he was Mr. It. But he always wanted to carry uh, his boys back to the farm. And so one year, 1963, we decided, he decided, <laughs> that, that we were sharecroppers. And I tell you, it was uh, the hottest year on record. <laughs> uh, it 
was, uh, the man had 28 acres of tobacco. Uh, some of the rows, you could not see the end. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was a, it was a good experience in many ways. I'm glad I, I actually had that experience of, of, of working on a farm. But it was, uh, it was a lot of work and uh, tremendous inequality. I, I remember when, when we, when the owner, well, not the, well I guess he could be the owner, <laughs> when, when the man who owned the property, because what we did was to provide our labor. And that was it. But I remember when he sold his first tobacco, his son, who was my age, came to me and said that daddy sold his tobacco and made $1,400. And my father already told us that he had received $350. I was 10, but I knew that <laughs> the three fifty was not half of $1,400. And so I told my father, he went and asked Mr. Walter, Mr. Walter, I understand that you sold the tobacco and you got $1,400. He said, yeah, I did. But you only gave me three fifty. But he said, you remember, I gave you five gallons of molasses. I, uh, I gave you flour. I allowed you to come to the meat house and get meat. I gave you boys a quarter of 50 cents every week. I did this, I did that. Well, I kept a tally of all of that. And so we were there from March until December. And when we moved back <coughs> to Hillsborough, he didn't have any money at all. And essentially, they had broken even. Right? And so if you are a slave, the man is furnishing you everything, and you're furnishing your labor. So if you're sharecropping, and at the end of the harvest, he tells you that we have we're broken even. I mean, essentially, that's the same thing. Uh, in in reality, that's the same thing. Of course, you know, in, in according to the law, you are you're no longer a slave. But but you know, these kinds of tenant farming, as all of you probably know, kind of akin to, in many ways. Uh, but I think I would rather have been a tenant farmer than a sharecropper in 1870-1875. I'd like to make three points that I think were very interesting. I think that when you look at it, the Civil War was the result of two competing economic systems, the plantation system in the South uh, versus the industrial system in the North. The other thing that I would, that, um, I would was as I pointed out to you, is it's interesting that the Republicans at the time of the Civil War have now become the Southern Democrats, um, and that the Democrats have now sort of shifted to the, today's Democrats have shifted to the position of the Republicans. And I have to think that the other thing that I'd say is that I have to think that people like McClellan and the generals who supported him, as well as what McPherson calls the Northern Democrats in the election of 1862, all they really wanted was to put the Union back together with the Southern economic system as it was, rather than have a whole radical revolution. Right? I, and I think today, too, we're still fighting a civil war. It's just an economic and social civil war that I see, you know, constantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good points. Mm -hmm. Well, until the Emancipation Proclamation, isn't that the position that Lincoln himself took? Yes. To, just to restore the Union, keep slavery as it was? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So, yes. When the, in our next readings, you're going to read um, a letter, well, actually, a document. Uh, Lincoln, I'm, going to, I'm not going to give it away right now, but Lincoln called a group of free blacks to the White House on August 14, 1862. And uh, that meeting actually summed up Lincoln's view 
of blacks in America. And essentially, that view is that we cannot coexist. That at some point in time, you're going to have to, to really usher your people together and y'all have to leave the United States. So the immigration, actually it was the immigration office uh, in, the, in the United States government that pulled together this meeting. Uh, because his view was that slavery is bad. I mean, you all have been dealt a bad hand. But what you also have to understand is that even though there are some decent people among you in your race, some who are very smart, um, we simply cannot coexist. And he actually pinpoints very specific places around the globe where he believes the conditions would be best uh, fitted for black folks. But I'll let you read that uh, for the next time. So you're exactly right. Yes, was, when you talked about the um, patrols, did the home guard come out of that? The home guard? Yeah, when I read... Um, That's what they were called in like the books, so, uh, Cold Mountain. Cold Mountain, that these people would... Um, I, I never really understood who they were. I, I never heard home guard. home guard as it related to the patrol system. So, no, I, they may have been two different. So what was the home guard? My understanding is that these were people who were capturing, like the soldiers going, they were capturing people who they accused of being uh, deserters. deserters in the army. Okay, this is during the Civil War? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Which I think the same thing. Never heard that as related to the patrols. patrols. Two different, two different things, I would think. Join, join Excuse me, Alice. I was very interested that the that the European powers. He says that they felt like that it was in, that the Union would not be able to recapture the Southern states when even Lee, you know, thought with the diff disparity of the economic structure that the South couldn't win. And I was surprised that the and wondered why why did the European powers think that? Did they not understand the difference in the economy? Was it just that it was such a vast territory that it seemed? I th my, my impression has always been that the European powers had their eyes on one thing, and, and that was cotton. <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is, I don't care how you cut it, uh, it's all about, because, you, you know, they were doing pretty pretty bad over there. Uh, people were unemployed. Uh, some pretty ugly conditions existed because export of cotton had almost come down to a trickle uh, by 1862. And uh, they were looking to, I mean, whatever they, they did, whatever their actions would have been, uh, whatever their actions were, were all, always related to, to cotton, to King Cotton, and, and how I mean, I, I guess diplomacy, you can pretty much define in one word. And that one word is expediency. I mean, you, you know, whatever is expedient for us at any given time. And that may be one of the reasons why over the years, you know, we, we are allied with, with somebody for a few minutes and then another few minutes we're not allied with them because it may not be expedient for us at any, any given time. I, I think that that was, uh, that was instrumental. You know, related to that, I wonder if James Mason ever came up with an idea like, hey, if you'll support the South or recognize the South, we'll give you something for two years. I mean, that would have been a good bargain. We could have. That was a good point. <laughs> the Brit, the, the Brit, uh -huh. oh, I'm sorry. Yes, good, Chris. Um, come back. Getting the idea that, you know, with the European and especially, you know, England and France being different, but also similar in this attitude, why they might think that well, they'll never be able to conquer the South. You have to remember how relatively small those countries are, mm -hmm, right. right? And how big the South is by comparison. They're probably just thinking practicality, like, you're not going to be able to occupy that. They're thinking that you'll have to have troops in every county of, of, of all those states. You know, that, that wasn't the point. I do think that Palmerston 
uh, understood that while it was, you know, still in memory of how we kicked them out of our country, <laughs> revolutions mostly don't work. <laughs> mostly the, the powers that be are the powers that be. It probably was not going to happen. Whereas, and in England, this was the time when the sun never set on the British Empire, despite the loss of us, right? He knew he had options, cotton-wise. They were going to be slower to come in, you're gonna, it's going to be a little bit of a, of a pipeline to fill. But he had options that Napoleon III did not, if you ask me. And I always got the impression that Napoleon III was much more interested in doing it. But then, he, because his options were li more limited, but he also knew he'd be, he'd be the first one standing alone to recognize the Confederate States had we not won Antietam. Yeah. I guess one question is, what was on Lee's mind going into Maryland? Right. What yeah. was the objective? Mm -hmm. Had he won, I mean, even if the South, even if Lee had taken Washington, D.C., what would that have meant for the future of the nation? Would all of the nation have become the Confederate States of America? <laughs> it would have demoralized, what would have happened? It would have demoralized the North so they would not want to continue I think conducting the war. Would have okay. They, they would have... It, they, the, the North would have been demoralized, yeah. but would there have would the United States of America have continued? <laughs> would Lincoln remain president of the United States if indeed Washington had been taken? Well, what's, what was the what was the prime motivator? Because it seems to me, in terms of our reading, they're telling us the two kinds of strategies you've got. Because in most revolutionary wars, we're fighting for the same territory. So we've got to take the territory, we've got to take the government, we've got to defeat an army. And what the South needed to do essentially was a defensive action. Whereas the North really had to invade the South and take it over, take over the government okay. and the rest. With, with so, that given. So did the Confederacy want the Northern Territory or did they want to be left alone? Well when you when you in the when when the when you when you're in an act of war you, you continue to define and redefine based on what happens. See, the, the objectives change according to the circumstances in which you find yourself. So, the question then is, we have been fighting a defensive war all this time. Mm -hmm. We want to be left the heck alone, <laughs> right? But we've made it this far. We've taken Washington. I'm just, just speculating. We've taken Washington, D.C. I mean, we can beat these people. So what, what do we do at this point? Do we actually, do, do they become our subjects now since we have defeated them? Or are we just simply telling you all, we've, we've gotten you beaten, now we want you to recognize us as a separate nation? Or do we actually subjugate these individuals? All right, let, let me go back here. Someone hasn't, hasn't said anything yet, and then we'll come I back. I think that uh, one of Lee's objective was to get into the border states where they was, he felt like they were wishy washy. I mean, that it was, uh, had, he had the opportunity for them to come forward and, and go with the South if, if they could be convinced with win. So he said, okay, I'm going to quit letting them invade us. Let's go up there on their soil, and then they're going to say, Hey, we better get out of this thing. We don't want to be for the North. We're going to be for the South because they are winning and we don't want any more fights up here. Okay. So I think that's what he was trying to do. And then he, they just wanted, I think they just wanted the border states. They didn't want New York. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, we're, we're striking it. Okay, let's, let's go here and then in the back. They would, I, I kind of suspect they, we would have had to recognize the South as a separate nation and the, the Union States would have been where the Mason-Dixon line is between Maryland and Pennsylvania. Um, that's what I think would have happened and you would have had it, you would have had the South that went from Texas uh, across the Florida and up through Virginia and uh, possibly including the state of Maryland, 
possibly not. Uh, and then everything from Pennsylvania north to Maine and over to uh, Illinois and Iowa would have been unionized, or would have been, you know, the, original, the new United States. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead and then. I, well, I didn't follow, kind of fleshing out what, what you were saying. My guess is that what Lee was really looking for was to get the border states to switch. And that a lot of Southerners, and, and the book talks about this, a lot of Southerners thought that the border states were really itching to leave and had been compelled by force to stay in the Union. And if Maryland and Kentucky had switched, um, it's quite possible that the Union position militarily would have been so bad that it would have been reasonable to expect them to go for a truce. Okay. And uh, I mean, getting Washington, I don't know that Lee ever talked about really going in there and getting it, but that could have been either a wonderful bargaining chip of, of some sort, or the man who sang over there a few minutes ago would have demoralized the North so much. I mean, in a lot of wars you have people, well, World War II, who, uh, thinking that if you bomb the civilians the other side, that would get them to surrender. It didn't work in World War II. But, but but were not the defenses up around Washington D.C. all the time? Yeah. Wasn't there a fear that yeah. this could happen? Yeah, we could. The newspaper reports we indicate that uh, right. it was going to happen. Yeah. So after one more point, point and then I'll, I'll yeah. go ahead. Um, in looking at the various things that he went north for, the possibility of bringing out secession forces in Maryland, in less likely in Delaware. But also at the time, instead of having this idea of these great things that we can accomplish by doing it, I see it so much more as he was just an offensive fighter, and he did that just because he had the initiative, and he felt like he would keep moving and force the other people to react to his plans. And all of these other things that were out there wasn't central to what he was doing. He was just trying to maintain the initiative and to make the other people react to what he was doing. He did not really have a clear idea of what he could accomplish with him. Okay. Let's just say that he had gotten support from all the border states and that they had taken Washington, D.C. This we, we, we're, we're playing now. <laughs> what, would have, what, what would the conditions have been by January 1863. What would America have looked like if the North had been defeated? Is the question. Would Britain and France have come in, particularly Britain come in, to try to negotiate a peace? Yes. Because I they, mean, they didn't want to fall out with either. My, 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 my question remains, mm -hmm. what would America have looked like on January 1st, 1863? We know what America looked like on January 1st, 1866, because the South was so-called defeated. But my question is, three years earlier, if the North had been defeated, and there were people who believed that indeed the North was on its last, I won't even say leg, its last big toe, <laughs> that it was, it was, it was down. So if, it, if that had become a reality, what would America have looked like on January 1st, 1863? Maybe we can't ask that right now. Maybe something you can think about over the next few because, you know, it's a, it's a no, everybody always talks about this northern offensive, southern defensive, but now the south is on the offense, and, this, and the north is defending. So what? would have been, what could have been some possibilities in terms of Lee's and Davis's thinking about, oh, we got the upper hand here. We have been under their thumb all of these years. They have been trying to, to reconstruct us in their image. These, these are the words of John C. Calhoun, you know, 40 years earlier. Now is the time for us to reconstruct the North? 
And I didn't watch that. I realize that people are often inconsistent with their stated ideologies, but it, it would have been 180 degrees away from anything the Southern people had ever said to rule over the North. But that doesn't mean they might not have wanted to do it as a way of keeping the North permanently from bothering them and, letting, and, and trying to affect slavery. But what in the heck would they have done with Wisconsin or Maine? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how, how do you get the slaves? Let me go to go Chris first and I'll come back. Okay. I'm going to suggest that if, had they taken Washington um, and had Lincoln still been alive, right, had he fled, right, in the same way Jeff Davis fled the base of Richmond, uh, and you still had Ulysses S. Grant, that what Shelby Foote, the historian of Missouri, said, Mississippi, sorry, Mississippi, <laughs> Uh, said that he always felt the North fought with one arm behind their back anyway. And that had a condition like this occur, a disastrous loss in D.C., right? They would have just put the other arm up from behind their back and really gone out. Yeah. I would have said it would have been a galvanizing event. Mm -hmm. And that McClellan would have been tossed quicker. Grant would have been put in charge. And until you got the rifle out of his cold dead hands, he would have, you know, you would have seen Grant the butcher in action. No, but I think his, his question is, assume all that didn't happen and that the North actually lost. Right. Well, I guess I think if you took Washington, I don't think that would have caused the North to lose. But that's not the question. Right. Okay. I mean, if you don't have a president of the United States, right. if you don't have a president of the United States who right. has fled, right. who may be dead. Right, and I say, if you don't have Lincoln, I think you do. It, 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 more of what you're talking about is more likely. I that's, that's a part of my scenario. Okay, okay. okay. so Lincoln's not there anymore. No, no. Okay, no, that does change things a lot. Yeah. Well, then you, you see you've got these slaves. And so to keep them from running to the north, um, you'd almost want to control the whole continent. Oh. Otherwise, the slaves, the southern economy collapses. Um, I'm not sure I understand your point. Well, you need to keep control of the slaves, not unless there's some You mean with my scenario, or what, what scenario are we talking about here? Your scenario. You, you have to take the whole country. Okay. Are you moving some of those slaves northward? I hope I'm running. They'd already voted with their feet. They were already voting with their feet and leave it. Um, and then, as you were saying, this, this helps us nuance history. And I'm so grateful for this because it's not all this, the North was against slavery and the South was for it. Because you had a population, and it's just like in Vietnam. Certainly we could have defeated Vietnam. But we lost the will of the American people to continue to support Vietnam. So would the northern uh, white population continue to support um, an aggressive war with the South? Good question. Mm -hmm. So I hand over here. Well, yeah. Is it possible then that if they had taken Washington and there were negotiations for a peace, that uh, they could have said, okay, you can join the Confederate States of America, providing that you, uh, ad you know, agree to our Constitution, and then you can be a separate entity. So we have Canada and the United States, and then the Confederate States. I don't know. I mean, it, it depends on what you want it to look like. I, I don't know. We go here. And then. I'm just just have a personal horror at the number of casualties. This war. And, I, and I haven't read anything where the, I mean, was the population upset by this? They didn't seem to be, at least in our readings. We haven't read anything. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Well, I mean, he doesn't really deal with that, but, yeah. but from other readings, but I mean, and, and what's going on in the society as a whole, people are definitely talking about this in all quarters. When, once they got word, oh yeah. But now and because they remember now, Photography is correct, but not enough to change things. No, I, I guess yeah. not. Not until yeah. 1865. Yeah. Back to your scenario, I, um, I think we should be careful not to equate Washington with Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, my sense is that the government would have gone north. The government, even if Lincoln had been killed, had a new president and money still would have talked, and industry, and the, the economic power of the North, and numbers. Okay. 
wouldn't have changed it. Okay. I mean, here, here, I don't know. We're speculating, right? I have no idea what it would have looked like. So the I question I have is who would make the decision for the North? The way he captured Lincoln? Johnson. He hadn't he wasn't the vice president. Okay. What would have been the effect that it would have on the the so called butternut sections of Illinois and Indiana and Ohio? that were sections that were largely populated by people that moved from Kentucky to the Carolinas and Virginia. Right. It's like, what would they have said? Would you have had a Northwestern <laughs> section, a New England section, and a Southern section? I mean, that's... You know, it, it's, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. It's complex. Yeah, yeah. But, I don't know. But he, he does make a point about Wall Street, because often the national policy is pushed by Wall Street and oh, yeah. depend upon how much British, French, and other money were on Wall Street, and sometimes other nations will intercede in situations like that because they're protecting their money okay. in terms of who's buying the bonds and things like that. Mr. Sanders? Explain what if. Okay. What if France and Europe and England had continued to do business with the South? If that had happened, they would have taken Maryland, they would have taken uh, uh, Washington, they would have taken uh, all of the land across. They weren't interested in the lands above that because you can't raise their thing if it's too cold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you would have had two countries there. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I, I just want some information. Uh, my grandparents were slaves in Georgia and Alabama, I don't know where, but they were moved to Texas. And I want to know, is there any bibliography that says, talks about why they were moved. I know they were moved because they thought Texas would not be in the Civil War. They yeah. wouldn't have to give up the slaves. I know that, but. Well, it depends on the point at which they actually moved. Yeah, but I, I would like to know, are there any books, any bibliography? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you about it afterwards, okay. but, but essentially Texas uh, grows because people from the South especially North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, began moving in that direction in the late 1820s and 1830s. And much of it had to do with the fact that there was soil exhaustion in the eastern part of, uh, in those uh, eastern counties. Uh, the folks over at UNC Chapel Hill had told North Carolinians uh, how to best grow their crops, um, that you need to slash and burn, you need uh, crop rotation, that if you continue doing it the way you've been doing it for you know, 100 years, that you exhaust the soil. And planters fired back saying, my granddaddy had been doing it like this. <laughs> my dad had been doing it like this, and I'm gonna do it like this. But what it resulted in was a huge out-migration to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, uh, Ohio. North Carolina lost about a third of its population. Uh, as a matter of fact, to give you an idea, I mean, I know these numbers. <laughs> in, in, in 1830, there were 245,601 slaves in North Carolina. By 1840, 10 years later, there were 245. 817 slaves in North Carolina. Now, if I had written that down, you could see that there was only a 216 slave difference in terms of growth. So what's happening is that slave owners are moving and they're carrying their slaves with them to Texas, to Alabama, to Mississippi. The slave, the, slave pop, the, the white population in North Carolina grew only by 12,000 during that time. But, but the slaves in Texas didn't know they were free. You know, that's why they had Juneteenth. They, well, did, they didn't know about the Emancipation Party. Yeah, they, they, you know, well, actually, that's a, I, 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 for the, 
Well, I don't know what For those of you who love Jean, Juneteenth. Yeah, I do. Actually, you know, it's, it's, it's really mythical. Uh, it's just like the Willie Lynch letter. I don't know if y'all heard of the Willie Lynch letter, but, but, but Juneteenth. It is, is something that we've been celebrating ever since 1865, but it essentially um, it has to do with the fact that Texas is a long way from, from Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. and, and by the time the folks got out there, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, of course, you've been reading about. But there was also an executive order of January 1865 that we don't hear very much about that was issued by, by President Lincoln. And, and those were the orders that actually brought slavery to an end. The Emancipation Proclamation of 1862 had absolutely nothing to do with the freeing of anybody. Not one slave was freed as a result of the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation because it was not designed to free anybody. Lincoln is saying what? South, if you, if you would put down your arms by January 1st, 1863, which is 100 days from September 22nd, 1862, you know, then uh, I, I, won't, I won't free your slaves. Mm -hmm. But, but if, you, if you don't put them down, I'm going to free your slaves. The South laughs. I mean, you are the United States of America. I'm the Confederate States of America. You have nothing to do with me. We're fighting. I'm going, to, I'm going to bring slavery to If you're really concerned about freeing the slave, why don't you free the ones in the border states? Why don't you free the ones in those areas where you already have control? So this was, all, all of you know that this was simply a show. It was a show of force. And he, he issued it when he issued it because of the Battle of Antietam. But it was not designed to free anybody. How many black folks on January 1st, 1863, left the plantation Declaring freedom. <laughs> Not one. Because it wasn't designed to do that. Now, the folks who lived on a plantation in North Carolina didn't know that that, that, that was the case. They know that this man in Washington by the name of Abraham Lincoln has issued this document declaring them free. And so Lincoln becomes this man. He becomes, you know, the savior. He becomes loved by black people because of that. But in reality, if they had put their arms down on November 1st or December 1st, 1862, then it wouldn't have been an issue at all. Right? Based on your reading? Is that the case? Yeah. So when we talk about Juneteenth and people say that black people didn't get word of the Emancipation Proclamation, of, eight, of the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, and it had been out there for three years, no, that was not the case. They didn't get word because Texas is a long way out there, and when the general rode out there and issued the orders, well, so he was fanning out, going southwest. And as he got to plantations, you know, he gave this information out that you're all free. Texas happened to have gotten it late, but it really has nothing at all to do with this notion that the people out there in Texas didn't allow their slaves to go free and didn't tell them about the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> That's what I always thought. And it, it's really. So I'm glad you know that. And, and I, I have, uh, and, and <laughs> I was on a PBS program about three years ago with a young lady who, who does this, and we were in the makeup room, and I was telling her what I thought, and she said, I'm not going out there with you then, because I've been pushing this thing for the last, you know, 10 years. And, but I said, no, I, I don't want to, you know, destroy your dream, but we can't, you know, we, we have to be, we have to be factual. Uh, we have to put it out there the way it was, rather than what we think and feel. You know, it feels good, it sounds good. Um, one of my students the other day said, and you see, that, that Willie Lynch letter, uh, I don't know how many of you heard of the Willie Lynch letter, but supposedly um, back in 1712, a man by the name of Willie Lynch came from 
the Caribbean, from the West Indies, and actually taught the people at Jamestown how to best correct a slave. And allegedly, he rode up the James River. And he said that as he rode up the James River, he looked over and saw a slave dangling from a tree. He had been lynched. Now, the, the letter goes on to say how you can best get your slave to be a good slave. And that over the years, you will have to separate them according to their color. You will have to separate the men from the women. You'll have to do all of this. I mean, all the things we know could have happened because the letter was written by some, somebody a few years ago rather than in 1712. Number one, the individual refers to, he uses the word highway, you know, a little information, <laughs> a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And so we kind of believe that it was an African American studies student 25 years ago who, who wrote this letter. It was introduced in 1995 when at the Million Man March when Louis Farrakhan mentioned this. And you may, have, may remember, if you've seen The Debaters with Denzel Washington, yeah. Yeah. Denzel Washington, you know, this story takes place in the 1930s and he says that the word lynch came from Willie Lynch. And, and I wrote the producers because I, it, it carried me to another level, I, I, you know? And so I wrote the producers and told them that whenever you want to learn, whenever, don't do this again. Contact some historians before you, you do this because this is ugly to actually say that Willie Lynch was a man from whom we got the word Lynch and that he was a slave owner who came from the West Indies and all of the historians who have written about slavery never found Willie Lynch. But here, all of a sudden, Minister Louis Farrakhan has found, Minister, has found Willie Lynch. So, you know, when, when we see these things, we have to, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to try to correct them. And, and so, Willie Lynch says that if you do this, you will find out that in the South, well, there was no South in 1712. <laughs> there was absolutely positivity. And a lot of words and phrases used that were not used have not been able to find Willie Lynch. And, and think about it now. How many white people do you know with the name Willie? <laughs> <laughs> and then why would you ascribe the individual the name Lynch? Because you have a little knowledge that black people have been lynched. And what he didn't know was, indeed, we use the word lynch because of Colonel Charles Lynch, who was an American revolutionary uh, colonel. And colonel Charles Lynch was appointed by George Washington uh, back in the, during the American Revolutionary War. And we had the Tories and we had the loyalists and the Tories, of course, uh, did everything in their powers to, su to support the Tories who were loyalists, support the British cause. But when you are uh, uh, tried, when, when you actually, when you have committed a crime or an offense, we don't have time to try you right here. So extra legally, we will do whatever it takes. So Colonel Charles Lynch would hang his victims by their thumbs and they had to exclaim liberty forever, liberty forever, liberty forever. And they would hang for hours and hours and hours. Well, during the 1770s and 1780s, when individuals took the law into their own hands, they would say what? Oh, lynching occurred. It didn't necessarily have to be putting the noose around the net. By the 1830s and 40s though, when individuals put a noose around the neck, then it was called a lynching but in honor of Colonel Charles Lynch and not Willie Boy, <laughs> not by any means. Uh, so when, when you see this kind of stuff, you know, you, 
you have to uh, correct it as, as much as you possibly can. Okay, it, it appears that our time is up. You have a lot of readings for <laughs> Mr. Sanders. You have a lot of readings <laughs> coming up. But it's some really, it's, it's some really good excerpts. So, but it's a lot of stuff that you need to take care of over the next uh, was a month or so, uh, including uh, an excerpt from Jubilee that many of you may have already read at some point in time. And, and you'll see uh, the document uh, where Mr. Lincoln pours together invites these uh, black men to the White House to talk about uh, immigration and some other good documents in that in those readings. All right. Thank you all for joining us.